the perils of the writing life and is a champion for all writers who cross her path. Here's my friend Bethany to talk about the intersection of creativity and matriarchy. Hello, everyone. Oh, we're vaccinated so we can hug. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much, Kim. Thank you. Um, good morning, fellow creatives. I'm so happy to be here. And how do I know you're creative? Uh, because you are here on a Friday morning, jamming out to amazing music. Big thanks to Savannah Red, Ansley and Tolson being inspired by the Creative Mornings Manifesto. Such great reading from our rising second grader and the Creative Mornings team that I have met to do this event. We have Brian and Ben and the amazing Kim and Anne, and then behind the scenes helping me out here at the writing barn is Marty. Um, so today we are refilling our well and your own coffee cup, except for Melissa, um, until we can all be together locally again. Um, so creatives are some of my favorite peeps, and I truly believe we're all creative. We are. What we aren't is always good to our creative selves. No matter what our gender or gender expression, learning how to mother, aka nurture, our creative selves is non-negotiable. If we don't, it will bite us in the ass. We'll be cranky, unfulfilled, and unmotivated. And over my 20 plus years as a writer, my 12 years as a published author, and my 11 years as a writing instructor, and my nine years as founder and creative director of The Writing Barn, I made it my mission to live a thriving literary life and to heal the unhealed, not just for myself, but for my fellow creatives too. I'm tired of creatives feeling trapped between our creativity and paying the bills, between our dreams and our to-dos, between our responsibilities to others and our deep desire to lead a life of our own design. All of that old school stuff about drunk and dangerous artists, starving artists, masochistic artists, and there not being enough good to go around is the patriarchy in action. Fuck that. Today, we are here to talk about the matriarchy. I normally talk to kids and I don't curse. So I'm embracing that. And if your kids are around, cover up their ears, okay? Um, so when I got invited to think about matriarchy, I started thinking about some of my core beliefs that I've used for years to kind of like mother myself through this creative life and that manifested at the beginning of the pandemic with me launching the courage to create community. So some of those core beliefs were creativity is not a competition. Ambition is not anything to be ashamed of. Rest is a radical act for the world and for ourselves. So we're gonna weave some of those through today and we're gonna talk a lot about, I'm gonna get real personal. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't been this personal in a long time, guys. We're at that point of the pandemic. Um, so what we are here to do today is to redefine for ourselves what it means to be creative, how to flourish and fly, how to set limits and ask for what we want. We are here to break free from the cage of what was and embrace the possibility of what can be. As I continue my talk, jot down for yourself on a scrap of paper or on your laptop muted or in the chat if you want, anything that may come up for you around these questions. How can I gather the skills and tools I need to learn? and to grow? How can I set boundaries, say no, not give in to guilt? How can I be my own best protector? That's what the matriarchy mother power is. We're a protector. What do I have to wrestle with from the past in my present to give birth to my creative future? All right, so let's start with what I think is the hardest part, uh, looking in the past your mother in the mirror. Along with being a writer, I always wanted to be a mom, but I also rebelled against being a mom. 
Taking on that role in the world the way I'd seen it done meant frustration, creative separation, loss of autonomy. And if I was completely honest with myself, I was scared to death of becoming my mother. Anyone else out there not want to become their moms? Let's start there. This is my mom, an amazing lady, a loving lady, a lady who could rock that shawl at a 70s wedding, check it out, sitting next to my mustachioed dad, the lady who brought me into this world, who taught me many things, love, forgiveness, persistence, but who failed to teach me self-care because her life was more about surviving than thriving. My mom, a girl born to alcoholic parents, who just this year, six years after she died, I discovered my mom found out, or we found out that the man my mom thought was her father was not. The man I thought was my grandfather was not. How and when did I find this out? You know, on a family Zoom on Christmas Eve, uh, when I learned a relative I never met died of COVID way back when the pandemic first began. You know, mom's uncle vacationing in Florida. No, I didn't know what the rest of my family was talking about. Living away from my siblings and being the one to forge a creative life, I often felt treated as the odd duck, the odd one out. Quickly, I learned some convos took place for a few years that I wasn't privy to, or, or maybe I had heard peripheries of, but it really kind of didn't settle in the way it did on Christmas, because some of my family swears that they did tell me. Um, so I learned that my brother got a DNA test a couple of years back for, uh, for a gift. Watch out with those gifts, guys. They're kind of intense. Um, <laughs> revealing that we are part Jewish. But we were Catholic, born on both sides, both sides, my mom and my dad's. Uh, Well, my dad was a Hungarian. My dad just recently passed. Love you, daddy. And I never, we never knew. So we we thought, let's start there. This was after my mom had passed. Um, My dad was born around the time of the Holocaust. Maybe there was some change in the family, some secret um, situation that came up because of that. But nope, our newfound Judaism was on my mom's side. And she and her younger brother were half Jewish. Um, This is like the reverse of the Danny Shapiro memoir, Inheritance, a memoir of genealogy, paternity, and love. Uh, Holy hell, okay. Uh, I knew my mom and dad's families had some dysfunction. Most families do. But my family combined had a little bit more than most. Um, We have a history of mental illness suicide, racism, alcoholism, where the women didn't work and some of the women in their younger years had been sexually abused. Yuck. So you see, family had always felt more than a bit icky to me, more than a bit unsafe. Still, we had heaps of love, not a lot of guidance or strong modeling, but we never once worried we've had food on the table or shelter over our heads. But like a lot of us who grew up in the 70s with parents born in the 40s or 50s, we parented our parents a lot more than they parented us. Hence books like The uh, Yeah Sisterhood, Running With Scissors, and movies like The Ice Storm. And I was determined not to repeat the past. I did and I didn't. Or I didn't (laughs) and I did really. I married young, 19, when I was planning to move to New York City to become an actress. My first real boyfriend, AKA the one I lost my virginity to, a Marine I met on the 4th of July. You can't make this stuff up guys. Um, He asked me to marry him and I said, yes. I thought love came but once and New York would always be there. So soon I was living in a trailer with shag green carpet, both the carpet and the trailer older than I was at the time in the boonies of North Carolina. It took me seven more years and a divorce and thankfully access to public health and birth control to finally get my college degree and get to New York City. And though I moved there to act, that's where I became a writer, a real writer, one who studied, wrote, submit, and got rejected 
rejections. So many rejections. Over the last 20 plus years, these rejections taught me many things. The first was, there I am, young Bethany in my acting headshot from like 2000, maybe 2099. <laughs> what I learned was I needed an artist community. I could not do this alone. And I didn't yet have the skills I needed to internally take care of myself, to take care of my physical self, yes. I could keep a roof over my head, I could pay my bills, but to take care of my emotional self, not yet. And in pursuing the literary life, I would need to do both. I'd have to keep a roof over my head and learn how to navigate my inner needs. I'd have to stop rebelling against my actual mother and discover and claim instead another type of mom, one who could get me to where I wanted to go. Publication, a creative career, a partner in a stable and strong marriage, and maybe perhaps one day with a kid of my own. I didn't really know back then that any of that was possible. It didn't feel like it was. As a young writer in New York City, I didn't have much, but what I did have was anger, a hell of a lot of it, and a deep desire to be heard. Then I realized that was a creative gift. It was and always will be a part of my creativity. And allowing myself to feel my anger, express it on the page, use it to create art was my first act of mothering myself. I 100% didn't see it that way at the time. I felt alone, scared, but I trusted my anger. It got me out of my parents' home. It got me out of my way too young marriage and it got me to New York City where I could breathe and be. My anger didn't hurt me, it protected me. It moved me forward. So takeaways for you on your creative journey. It's not just about me, it's about you. What gifts did your childhood give you? They may not look like gifts or felt like gifts at the time, but if they added to your survival, indeed, they are gifts. And if you have mama baggage, journal about it, read memoirs, seek therapy, practice self-kindness. And maybe just maybe you can start to see the woman who brought you into this world as the flawed but beautiful woman she was. There's my mama, a product of her times with her own unhealed places who could have done better, but who did the best she could. And that was enough. She was enough. Didn't know I'd get emotional. I am enough. And you are enough. Your mom was enough. How do I know that? Because here we are together, surviving, some of us thriving, and some of us on the way to thriving. Now we're going to talk about raising your creativity. As I dot my eyes, <laughs> get my act together with a sip of water. <laughs> Anne Lamott has a saying I often quote, not the one about shitty first drafts. You guys have heard that one. This one is about scooching and stalling. I wish grace and healing were more abracadabra kind of things and that delicate silver bells would ring to announce Grace's arrival. But nope, it's a clog and a slog and a scooch on the floor and the silence in the dark. So here I was, a semi-young creative, late 20s. Now I think that's young. I didn't at the time. With a deep desire to publish, to be heard. And I began to parent myself by finding other creative mamas. Some I found in books. Anne Lamott, Marianne Williamson, Zora Neale Hurston. Some I found in music. The Indigo Girls, Tracy Chapman, Ani DeFranco. And some I was lucky enough to find in person. This is Norma Fox Mazur, a mentor of mine from grad school. Shout out to VCFA, Vermont College of the Fine Arts, if we have any friends from there. Um, we got a lot of Austinites who graduated from there and a woman who I see as my first creative mama. When Norma entered my life, I was a 9-11 survivor. There that fateful Tuesday coming up on 20 years this year. 
And I had asked Arun Gandhi, grandson of the Mahatma, to work with me after hearing him in New York talk to New York City in an effort to help us heal from the trauma of terror. I was already agented when I met Norma, not when I asked Arun Gandhi to work with me, but I wouldn't sell a book for another eight years or so. Norma in the early 2000s had been at the height of her career for about 20 years. She was a Newbery Honor author, an Edgar um, winner, so many, so many great awards to her name. She had a fierce intellect and loved to wrestle with ideas and with words. Norma was the first woman who told me that I too had a fierce intellect. A male professor in undergrad told me I could write, but Norma is the writer who had me realize I always had been a writer. I thought like a writer. I processed things like a writer. I made sense of the world with words. And though our careers were oh so different, she's the first woman I allowed to guide me, to hold my figurative hand as I sorted some things out. With her, I realized I could feel my feelings deeply and not fall apart. Observing and daydreaming could be a way of life. And rallying against injustice, unfairness, and even holding the desire to be a mother, Norma was a mom, and not be swallowed whole by motherhood could fuel my work in the world, not extinguish it. With Norma as my mentor, I learned about scenes and structure, not just in my writing, but in my life. I learned. I was my finest protagonist, a main character who has wants and needs and flaws. And I didn't have to apologize for the part of me that had always been ambitious, that wanted more, not to get more, but to be more, be more. That's what ambition really is under the matriarchy. It's about being, not about getting or having or taking or stealing. I learned I had drive, I learned I had dedication and that I had talent. I could own all of those things and they could be my greatest possessions and no one, no one could take them away from me. Not a rejection, a silly piece of paper that told me no. Not voices from my past, AKA my family, that told me women only worked inside the home. That writing was a hobby, my writing was a hobby. That I felt too much and angered too easily and not the patriarchy that paid men more, respected their words and talents, and liked to urge women to stay home, to stay calm, to stay quiet. Norma's husband was also a writer. His career, her career eclipsed his, but they rode away their days and nights together in love. Norma was one of my first four mentors at Vermont College of Fine Arts that I was partnered with in grad school three women, one fella, who I call my creative dad, <laughs> uh, Tim Wynn Jones, if any of you know his work. Norma helped me conceive my novel, and she blurbs the book up there on the screen, dying a few months before or after the book came out in 2009. Um, Norma's blurb, I had to go look it up to do this talk, and I was like, wow, what Norma said about my book, um, I was experiencing in my life. That's what I mean when I think and talk about writing our own personal writing, whether it be fiction or memoir, this was fiction, was like healing myself, okay? So now takeaways for you. Who is, or what books, music, art, by women or women identifying creatives paved the way for you and your work? Who is a mother mentor that helped you give birth to the creative that you are? What do you owe her? What are you thankful for? I'm so thankful to Norma. Now we're moving in, into the present, mothering myself while I raise my son, <laughs> mother my son and my creativity. There I am right before going to get induced at Austin Seton Hospital. Um, and now we're gonna look at what's happening right now and how to take better care of our writer selves, our creative selves, our dancer selves, our artist selves. We have to properly and consistently be mothered in order to truly feel playful, to readily access our creative impulses. 
I want us to think about our creative selves as a troop of kids at various ages that live inside of us. At times, there's the temperamental toddler, the clingy infant, the brave and bold 10-year-old speaking up when no one else will. We have teen angst, hating being told what to do and how to do it. And then there's the harried mother trying to cook the meals, pay the insurance, walk the dog, let alone corral all these creative kids into one minivan to go in one direction, the direction of our dreams. Our creative selves get hungry for food, for newness, for serendipity, for stability. Our creative selves need guidance on how to be brave, take risks, lean into our talents, strengthen our weaknesses, say no to others, and take the time to rest and hold the space for growth, opportunity, and change, as well as work with the challenges of time and scheduling and all the needs that press in on us. What I'm learning is I take on the role of mothering myself, my creative self, which is my full self, is to practice kindness and self-compassion. This is from Kristen Neff. The real treasure offered by mindfulness, its most amazing gift, is that mindfulness provides us with the opportunity to respond rather than simply react the opportunity to respond rather than simply react. That is key. That is nurturing. There's no loss of self there when you take in others' needs and wants. And there's no barrier between you and them when you take on your own needs, wants, and creative desire. Mother energy checks on and checks in. Does our creative self need a bath, a retreat, a snack break, a walk, a convo with friends, a stretch, a screen, new materials to play with, clay, dance, sculpture, stand up. You can be the screaming toddler, the angry teenager, burgeoning adolescent, and you can hold a hand to your heart, skin to skin, as new mothers hold their babies. That's my little guy six years ago. And you can ask and say to yourself and ask yourself, dear one, what is it that you need? How can I make this better, more bearable? You can ask yourself and say to yourself, I am here for you. Creativity is here for you. We will not leave you. You can create in anger, you can create with delight, you can create from boredom, and you can create in minutes tallied over many, many months. You can create any time, any time. In fact, you're creating all the time. You can create, you can nurture yourself, you can heal. This is the art of the matriarchy. We need mothering to face our wounds, personal and cultural, and to heal them fully under a loving eye that values seeing things through to completion. Tap into it. Where will it take you? To the page, to the stage, to your own healing, to the world's. And when you need a refill of inspiration, come back to creative mornings, come back to community, come back to yourself. And you can always find me over here at the Writing Barn in South Austin, doing the best I can. And as another of my creative mothers taught me, do the best you can until you know better. Then when you do know better, do better. Let's do better, everybody. That's what the matriarchy is. Thank you so much for having me today. Ah, didn't know I would cry. <laughs> That often happens. I kind of should have guessed. <laughs>I've got one from Rin and then we're going to, oh, Rebecca's, Rebecca's got one too. So Rin okay. is asking, how did you approach getting a matriarchal mentor outside of consuming their creative pieces? Ah, so 
I went to grad school and at grad school, like we got to match with certain people. We got to like designate, you know, a number of writers. And interestingly enough, in my field of children's publishing, um, there are so many women and very few men. However, it's the men that win the awards and get paid more in the big cachet. Um, and I chose Norma because I heard she was the queen of structure and I went to, to grad school to learn structure. There are other ways to get mentors versus attend grad school in any type of field. Um, I think in terms of looking for a female mentor, look right around here at your Creative Mornings community, at your Austin community, or wherever you should live. Um, there's also ways to get mentoring online. We do that through the Courage to Create with a group. Um, I mentor writers one-on-one. -on -one. Many of them are now published, like helping them move through the pre-published years to crossing over into the author life and then looking at all the challenges that the author life has. We often think when we're in that pre-published apprentice state that everything will be fine and rosy once we get a book deal. And that's not true. We have to grapple with all of this stuff I kind of talked about today with self-care, with balancing time and intention, with telling the truth on ourselves, about ourselves, all of that. So I would look around, look around for a brave lady around you and see what she's up to and um, see if you can um, engage with her in a way that is comfortable for her and comfortable for you. Um, my question, hi, Bethany. Hi. <laughs> um, my question is, can you talk a little bit more about when, how you check in on yourself for self-care? Mm. Like how It seems like something that should be really easy, but what are the steps that you take to to get that going and to keep it's, it going. Yeah, it's not easy. And it's something I'm learning and experimenting with and that I'm committed to because I was burned out for several years, burned out as a writer, burned out as a creative writer, burned out as a mama. Um, everything kind of happened for me all at once. And about 2016, Grandfather Gandhi came out and I got pregnant, the writing barn, like everything happened. And I was like, how do I juggle all of this? I got to do it all. I got to take care of others. Um, and what I realized amid that was, I was really working hard as a people pleaser. Um, I kind of learned that young in life and learned that as a coping mechanism. So my first self-care thing was deep therapy. Shout out to my therapist who's here in Austin, Audrey Steele. <laughs> She'll laugh if she hears about this. Um, and then also um, I realized I needed to stop people pleasing and really think about my vision for myself. And if something in line with my vision, then it was easier to say yes or no to. It was easier to prioritize. Oh, I need, I'm getting cranky right now. I need to stop everything. The pandemic really taught me a lot. Like the beginning of the pandemic, we have, um, you know, a retreat space, um, an event space, everything shut down. Um, and so my travel shut down. I had time to be by myself. I had time to go slower, even as I was like pedaling the wheels under the water, trying to keep the, you know, things afloat for myself and for my family. But I realized like, I don't have to pedal so hard and um, I need to trust. I need to trust my good getting delivered to me. I think that I like look for ways now where one of the things I'm doing for my self-care is I look, I used to look for all the ways I wasn't supported right? It just kind of felt natural to go through life like this one woman show. I had to do it. I had to be it. I had to get there. And what I eventually realized was, my God, I got here because of all the support I'd gotten along the way. I'd always been supported. So now I end every day like looking for the support. Where was I supported? Instead of lamenting, why aren't I supported? And really like doing daily check-ins, meditating, stopping everything, um, stretching, walking. I literally will now put my hand to my heart. Probably shouldn't have done that with my mic. <laughs> put my hand to my heart and ask myself, what do you need right now? No one had ever, like, I, I wasn't taught to do that for myself. And I think it's so important. So just stop, put your hand to your heart. What do you need right now? Think about your vision. And uh, 
and, and it's going to be messy. It doesn't have to be perfect. Self-care is not, um, you know, there's no grade A in any of it. And another Anne Lamott quote, like the perfectionist is the voice of the oppressor. So don't, no messy, I'm messy. No, no perfectionism over here at all. I loved what you said about putting your hand on your heart and asking yourself, what do you need right now? Because someone told me just yesterday that your brain doesn't know the difference between um, you saying out loud versus someone else. So your brain yeah. actually processes it like someone else is asking you what you need. And I think that's really good. Also, pl quick plug. I just want to say the writing barn has changed my life. I don't know if people realize the power that's there. And so I'm really hoping everyone here checks it out. Bethany didn't know I was going to say that, but I have to because it's Rebecca is one of my mentees that's now published. Check out her book back there. Mm. Alexandra and the awful no good, very bad dates parody picture book parody. I um, it's just incredible and funny and hilarious. And Rebecca is awesome around town. She works at Texas Center for the book. Um, maybe she'll be speaking at one of these down the line. <laughs> Sounds Thanks, like Rebecca. you need to talk to Rebecca. You do need to talk to her. <laughs> like, uh, Marsha has a question and I think had Kim had one and I think we're going to, we'll wrap it up with those two. So awesome. Marsha. Hey, Bethany. Hey, Marsha. Um, I just had a quick question. Um, do you have any helpful suggestions for creatives to stay creative and not feel overwhelmed um, when they're going through economic hardship. Yeah, it's been really tough um, amid the pandemic. Um, you know, our avenues have closed. So much has been happening. And one of the things I think we need to do is to look around um, and think of new avenues and new ways that we can support ourselves revenue wise. I talked about that in the talk, like we don't just need to nurture ourselves. We also have to pay our bills and we don't just have to pay our bills. We also have to nurture our creativity. So, um, I think there's, you know, see what you can do. That's different. Um, that maybe somebody else isn't offering. I know lots of people pivoted to, online teaching. There we have Marsha's daughter, like maybe doing some art classes for kids. I know Marsha happens to be a virtual, I mean, a virtual, a visual artist, um, a painter and an illustrator, um, you know, maybe potentially explore new markets, like what is happening. Um, and then also with the overwhelm part is just allow yourself to feel it. Fighting against it doesn't do any good like saying, I'm not overwhelmed. This is not happening. It's not bad. Say, wow, this is hard right now. I'm feeling pressure. And I think then you can free yourself up to move through to those generative ideas instead of just trying to keep those pressures at bay and pretend it's not going on. We are in a global pandemic. We are in a racial reckoning. We are in economic hardship. So we need to be conscious of those things and let it infiltrate our art and then put our work back out into the world and trust that our good's gonna come. Our good's gonna come for all of us. Hmm. That is hard. I'm, I'm so grateful that you're giving us a real tool. It's amazing how important it is to just say things out loud. I think what, uh, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting. Rebecca said it, you know, I, that was so insightful that your brain hears voices, even your own as outside of itself. So telling yourself that out loud might be a big step and, yeah. and, hi, and a little hi to Maple there. Yeah, so Maple. Nice to see Maple with, <laughs> with you there. Um, Kim, you've got the chance to, to ask the last question. Come on in, Kim. Okay. All right. So I guess what is next for you creatively? Either Ooh. a project or maybe the writing barn or your courage to create. Like what, what are you most excited to sort of play with? next. Ooh, what am I excited to play with next? Um, so, um, because of the courage to create community, this has been a goal of mine for a couple of years now. I have a craft creativity book that I want to write the courage to create 
call on community and tell yourself yes when the world says no. So I'm kind of like experimenting and playing with some of that. I'm also thinking about writing a motherhood memoir. <laughs> if you didn't get enough of my drama today, um, maybe that'll end up in the pages of that. I do have picture books coming up um, and collaborations with some people. And then at the Writing Barn, we're opening up slowly. People are renting from us to do events. We're still doing virtual events um, for the most part. And, you know, Another thing is like giving my creative team tools. Um, so, you know, myself as the founder, like as I continue to step away um, and play with my creativity a bit more now that things are up and running, that they're not left to their own devices and their own creativity. On our staff, we have Evan Griffith, who has a picture book out and a novel coming out. Um, Jessica um, Hinkapi, there's gonna be a project announced that she's publishing something. So the people around me, their creativity and what's next for them is also a part of what's next for me. I can't help it, I care too much. <laughs> but I'm not people pleasing anymore, I promise. <laughs> awesome. Well. Look forward to that. I think we'll probably be able to follow along uh, if we follow the writing barn. And if, if y'all haven't been there, as things start to open up here, please find yourself in South Austin. Uh, you won't know you're there until you're there because it's just a <laughs> gem tucked away uh, in a neighborhood that, that'll surprise you, uh, just like Bethany has this morning. So thank you so much, Bethany, for sharing of yourself. Okay, I think that's it for everyone. We hope that you have a fantastic weekend. We'll see you next month for another Creative Mornings. Until then, um, we love y'all. We'll see you soon. Everybody have a Creative Mornings. So much love.